Hi, and welcome to High School Physics Explained. What is friction? Well, here I have a little cart and it's not moving and friction is stopping it from sliding down the track. When I tap it, it accelerates. It doesn't come to a stop. Clearly, another friction is involved in this situation. And why is that the case? And why, for example, if your car starts to skid, why can't you get grip back again? Well, in this video, I'm going to explain to you the physics of friction. So let's start by defining friction. Well, basically, friction is a force that resists motion. And friction can be categorized in one of four ways. The first way is simply a static type of friction. You apply a force and it resists the motion of the object. You find the object is not moving. Another type of friction is what we refer to as sort of sliding friction, or more correctly, kinetic friction. That is, it seems to be a resistance whilst you're moving. And if you've had an experience on a water slide, you'll know what I mean. The third type of friction is an example of what we call rolling friction. So basically it's the friction you might experience that resists an object rolling across. And the final type of friction is a friction called fluid friction. Traditionally you would think automatically of the resistance that water might have as you move through a pool, but it could also mean simply the air moving around a jet aircraft. Again, the substances are behaving like liquids and are providing some sort of resistance to the motion. And we're going to concentrate particularly on static and kinetic friction. So here I have a simplistic diagram of an object sitting on a surface. As I apply a force, let's say going from left to right, I'm going to find some sort of resistance, which is shown here by my green arrow. I have an arrow also here that represents the normal. The normal, of course, is the force that this surface applies onto the block. And it is equal in this situation to the weight of the block. So what affects friction? And of course, based on common experiences, friction is determined by one of two factors. And the first factor, of course, is the surface that it's sitting on. So I might, for example, push a block across a piece of wood and find I'm getting more resistance than if I apply the same force onto the block while it's sitting on a sheet of ice. But the other factor, of course, if the object is heavier, then I would expect there to be more friction. The friction is clearly dependent on the weight of the object, but we're going to use a reference to the normal force because ultimately that is what the force is being applied onto the block surface. So let's start by looking at static friction. And static friction is the friction that keeps an object stationary and keeps it at rest. So you apply a force and you're finding you're getting a resistance in the opposing direction. The harder you push, the harder it seems to resist. In other words, the force seems to be always balanced out. And that is the nature of static friction. That is, the friction value changes the more force you apply to it, up to a point. I have a little animation from FIT to show you what I mean by that. So here is my block, and you can see that there are two forces acting on the block. And the first force, of course, is the force due to gravity, and that's the blue force acting downwards. Of course, the other force acting on the block is the normal force. Now, when I apply a force onto the block, you can see the applied force, which is the orange force, and we have the frictional force applied in the opposite direction. Frictional force, in this case, is the static friction. You can see that as I increase the applied force, so does the frictional force. If applied in the opposite direction, again, the frictional force adjusts itself in matching the applied force. And that is the nature of static friction. It equals the applied force in the opposite direction. It resists its motion. And that is up to a point. So for example, if I applied the force to a particular point and go beyond that, then suddenly, of course, it starts to accelerate because there is a limit reached in terms of friction. And suddenly we now have kinetic friction. We can also look at this graphically. So when I apply the force you can see the applied force increases and the red line represents the frictional force. And you can see as I change the applied force, the opposing force, the frictional force matches it in the opposite direction. So let's look at kinetic friction. What is kinetic friction? 
Well, basically it is the friction that once static friction is overcome, the force of kinetic friction is something that slows a moving object. And inherently kinetic friction is either equal to or less than the static friction. And I'll explain that further in the video. Mathematically, what does that mean? Well, similar to static friction, the kinetic friction is equal to, again, the force of the normal, which in this case is acting vertically upwards, multiplied by a coefficient of friction. This time it's the coefficient of kinetic friction. And as I said to you, it is a little lower than the value for static friction. But that is not its only difference. The other difference is, is that the value for kinetic friction is a constant value regardless of the rate of motion that's going on. It is a constant force in the opposite direction of motion. So now let's examine the value for kinetic friction. So if I apply a force on my block, you can see my static friction takes place. Now as I increase the force, you'll notice that the static frictional force increases. But place close attention to what happens to the frictional force once the object starts to actually move. What you should have seen is that the value for the frictional force, first of all, decreases. It is less than the static friction. The second thing you should have seen is that the value remained constant regardless of the applied force. Let's examine this in a graphical form. Again, I'm going to apply a particular force and as you can see, my forces increase. But once I reach a certain point, you can see here, we have my force here applied that increases to a particular point. And suddenly the value for the frictional force decreases. And then it remains constant. And of course it remained constant until it went off and crashed into the edge. So now let's examine different values of coefficients of friction, both in terms of static and also kinetic for a variety of substances. You can see for all of these cases, the coefficient for static friction is greater than the coefficient of kinetic friction. Substances are quite high. So for example, rubber on concrete, which is the case of let's say a tire on the road has a coefficient of one. However, if it's sliding, the coefficient is 0.8. You can see that steel on steel is 0.74 and likewise the kinetic friction coefficient is 0.57. It isn't necessarily a particular fraction consistently across. So here, for example, with rubber on glass, the values are almost equal. Same with rubber on concrete, where there's only a marginal difference. But if you start looking at metal on metal, you can see that the coefficient of kinetic friction is a less than half of the coefficient of static friction. If we look at ice, you can see it's significantly lower. And then in synovial fluid, which is the fluid in your joints between your bones, you can see that the coefficient of static friction, of course, is really low, which is what you want. You want lots of lubrication and very little resistance. But you can see the coefficient of kinetic friction is significantly lower still. But why is that the case? Why is there a difference between static friction and kinetic friction? And why is kinetic friction lower than static friction. To explain that, I want to give you a small analogy that will hopefully help you understand what's going on. So here I have a road that is corrugated and these bumps are formed due to cars driving fast across the road and the suspension bounces up and down and then what we get is these little dips along the road surface. Let's have a look at that from a perspective of the side view. Here's my car and the car is running over the corrugations. Now, if the car is stationary, it's going to sit in one of these corrugations. And so therefore to move out of the corrugation, it's not only going to have to move forward, it's also going to have some force to push it up to go above on top of the corrugation. In other words, it requires more effort to move out of the corrugation. Now, if the car is moving relatively fast enough, then what's going to happen, the car is going to skim across the top of the corrugations and it probably won't have time to dip inside the corrugations. And as a result, it is actually less impeded as it moves across the corrugated surface. If you'll understand that, then you'll understand the nature of friction. Ultimately, surfaces aren't evenly and smooth. That is that they are at an atomic scale, 
very, very rough. And if I place these two substances close together, you can see to some degree they interlock. And therefore to move them across requires a fair amount of effort. It will require them to separate a little for us to move it across. So if I leave it in the locked position, so to speak, like this, I'm going to require a lot of force to get it separated, to get it to move across each other. That is static friction. But if I move it fast enough, then chances are I'm going to be able to move this across the surface. It's not going to form into the dips and therefore you're going to have less friction. Hence we have kinetic friction. Of course, if I rub this hard enough, I will knock some of the edges off as we go. And of course, that's the whole process of sanding and why we can smooth substances by simply knocking off the edges over here. And therefore, of course, you lower the value for both kinetic and static friction. Now, another question that's often asked, why does surface area not affect friction? If I have a particular object here and an object here, you can see that the surface area for this object is greater. Whereas this object, the surface area is much smaller. But ultimately, the actual normal here is a sum total of all the normal forces for all the particles on the surface. So we are actually spreading the load here. And so that this force is representative of the sum of all the forces acting all along the surface. This is true for here as well, but it's now concentrated. So we actually have a greater pressure here. So although the surface area is reduced, we have less contact. The fact that there is less surface area means that all the forces concentrated in a smaller area, we have greater pressure. And so therefore, any loss of surface is balanced by the increase in pressure. So for all intents and purposes, therefore, the force of friction in both cases are identical. So now let's apply everything that we've learned. You can see here I have my values for the normal force and the gravity in this situation. And if I apply a force, you can see I'm going to have a frictional force that opposes. That is going to be our static friction. Now the value that I reach to get it to accelerate ends up being approximately 500. So there you go. What would happen if I increased the static friction? Well, let's increase it like so to a value of 1.1. You're going to see the value that I need to get it to move is significantly high. We're already at 695. And in this case, it requires a larger, a much larger force for it to start to move. Now, what would happen if my kinetic friction were to be increased? And as you can see in this animation, my kinetic friction isn't allowed to be greater than the static friction. So I'm going to here apply a static friction and a kinetic friction of equal values. And again, I'm going to return my object in the opposite direction by applying a force in the opposite direction. You can see I get to a point where my frictional force then remains constant. And then I have a applied force slightly greater. And so it starts to accelerate. Of course, if I reduce these values like so, and then increase the object's mass, then of course my normal increases and therefore the frictional forces increase as well. But now let's have a look at a ramp situation. I'm going to place my object on the ramp like so. And you see here I have my normal force and this is significant. If you've watched my video on normal, you'll know now that my normal force is slightly less than the weight due to gravity. And so in this case, my frictional force is counteracting the net force of these two vectors. And so in this case, we can see it's in balance. We have a situation of static friction. If I were to push it slightly, you can see the forces can still increase. But again, my applied force may, is actually not that very big because now my applied force is added up to the force that is resolved between the normal and the weight. And so there's a great frictional force going. And now I've got a situation which simulates what we had with the cart. I have now a very finely balanced situation where my cart is sitting stationary. And that is because the frictional force is 
equal to the net resolve forces of the normal force and the gravity. But if I gave it a slight push, in other words, I get it to move, we then have a frictional force that is kinetic. But in that case, because of the fact that the kinetic friction is less, it no longer balances out the net force acting down, and so it will start to slide and it will not come to rest. Until we get to the bottom, where we have a level surface. That, in essence, is also why a car is unable to stop once it starts sliding. You have a kinetic friction that is less than the static friction. And so, therefore, for a car to stop, it has to regain traction again. I hope that has helped you understand kinetic friction, static friction. I'm Paul from High School Physics Explained. Bye for now.